Hello. Hello. Cool. I can hear you. you hear me? Yeah, I got you. Groovy. So what's the G stand for? Uh, Garrett was my first name. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. I, nice I to meet you, Gary. Uh, sorry, Gar Garrett, not Gary. It, yeah. Oh, Garrett. Okay. I'm terrible. I'm terrible at pronunciation. Yeah, you roboted like, a little there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, my buddy was like, uh, hey, you like to debate in the bars. Go to this website. And I'm like, eh, I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty fun times. I like it. It's uh, saved my Facebook friends from having to listen to my endless rants about, well, everything. <laughs> so, so that's yeah, good. You, I like it a lot. You destroyed one of my buddies. Uh, it would have been Friday. Yeah. Friday. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I've been debating a ton lately, so it makes me happy. Yeah, you were. Uh, he was in the uh, uh, Jeffrey, the transgender debate. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He was one of the buddies that told me to join on to this. I'm like, eh. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll have fun. I'm, uh, you know, I've, uh, if it's not a tournament, I take it a little less. Uh, uh, I don't know, less dramatically, uh, or if it's you know if it's a grudge match or something, then I'll then I'll go hard at it. But yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more here to discuss the topic. But I'll I'll try to prove my point that Americans own too much stuff. Um, I used to own a lot of stuff. I don't own a lot of stuff anymore. Uh, so I'll, let me tell you just a little bit about my story, since this topic is vaguely personal in that sense, not in the emotional sense, but just a personal experience. So um, about two years ago, uh, my wife and I decided that we wanted to travel around the country and see America, visit all the national parks and uh, just see what the country was all about. So I um, sold all my stuff. I sold my house. I had an estate sale. I invited my friends and family to come over and buy my stuff. And then I invited strangers to come over and buy my stuff and then everything else that was left over pretty much that didn't fit into, I think it was about 10 plastic boxes, got shipped off to the um, the Goodwill just across the street. Fortunately, they, they were right next to where my house was. I bought an Airstream trailer. Uh, I put all the remaining stuff that I had in the trailer, uh, took a couple boxes of old mementos and put those at my parents' house because they were like, you know, you can put things at our house. I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess so. So, uh, and uh, then I've been traveling around the country. So I live in about 300 square feet of space um, most of it occupied by some pieces of furniture and I, you know, anything that I own, uh, travels around with me, uh, in said space. So I've kind of gone down minimalistic and I got to say, mm, life is a little bit nicer than it was when I had a lot of stuff. I liked my stuff, you know, don't get me wrong. It was, it was fun yeah. stuff. <laughs> I had all kinds of things, lots of games and miniatures and toys. And I, you know, I wasn't quite a collector, but I had a lot of things. Um, and you know, can't say that I, I missed that. I enjoyed it. I can't say I missed it, but let, let me talk about, um, you know, I don't know that I had too much stuff, but I think a lot of Americans do. Uh, as we know, consumer culture is really strong in America, drives our vibrant economy, which is a good thing, but there you can have too much of a good thing. Uh, and there's a downside to kind of over accumulation. And I think we've come to love our stuff a lot of the time more than we love ourselves. And that's kind of a problem. Um, oh, a good way to illustrate this is the storage business. So uh, until 1960, there was no such thing as personal self-storage. People didn't have storage units. Maybe they had a barn. Um, you know, maybe they put stuff in their attic and whatnot. But today it's a $36 billion a year industry just for a place to put your stuff they're not going to do anything with. Uh, it, there is more than 2.47 billion square feet of personal storage units in the United States alone. This year, the industry will spend $600 million to build more of it. 30% of what is stored in storage units has been there for more than two years. And that percentage doubled from 2007 to 2013. And it keeps going up as we stuff more stuff away and then just ignore the fact that it even exists. At the same time, the size of our houses have grown from 1,600 square feet back in 1973 to 2,000, uh, 2,700 square feet in 2016. And it keeps going up. Americans get bigger and bigger houses. And yet, they have even more stuff than they can put in these giant houses. They've got to buy storage units to put it out there. 15% of those who were asked said that they stored things that were, quote, things they no longer wanted or needed in their storage units. This, to me, is completely irrational and crazy. They're spending good money to keep things they don't need. It boggles my mind. Uh, and I think a large percentage of that other 85% are kind of in denial, especially those that have had their junk in there for two years. I think if you have something for two years and you do nothing with it, you probably don't need it um, in your life and you're just wasting your money storing it somewhere. 
Um, also, wasted time. Studies have shown that Americans waste an average of 55 minutes per day looking for stuff they own, but they don't know where to find it because their house is so full of crap and it's not organized. Now, part of that is organization. If you're organized, you can store more stuff. But still, uh, also, they suffer millions of dollars in losses because of lost bills that they can't find, so they suffer late fees on, lost gift cards they never turn in, checks that they're supposed to deposit and never do. Um, millions of dollars, many, many families are lost because they just misplace things in their cluttered homes that they can't find. And this gets really extreme in some cases. Um, studies have shown that compulsive hoarding affects up to 6% of the population in the United States. Up to 19 million Americans suffer from a mental problem that creates extreme distress in their life, that their homes are just filled to the brim with crap. Um, I've had relatives that have had this problem and friends who have had this problem, and it is uh, kind of a nightmare. And uh, it's, it's not just kind of like, you know, messy and uncluttered. It leads to all kinds of health effects, uh, infections on the skin because people are scraping up against this stuff. They don't clean their house very effectively. They can't find their things like the bathroom is filled with junk. So they're always cutting themselves, falling down and getting injured, having piles of boxes fall on them. To anyone who doesn't live like this, this seems like some kind of weird, insane nightmare. But there are 19 million Americans whose homes are like giant rat piles of stuff. I've seen these places and it's really quite scary and frightening. High rates of depression, unneeded stress, suicide, feelings of loneliness, all kinds of problems stem from this. People who just have a lot of stuff don't quite qualify as hoarding also show higher levels of stress um, and difficulty in their life and, and, and other problems as well. It's, it can really crush you. And so my message is, you know, I don't, if you have a big home and you got room for some stuff, that's great. But Americans have just gone berserk with this to the detriment of their souls, you might say. So this is the mantra that I try to live by. Uh, your stuff should be in service to your life. Your life should not be in service to your stuff. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, and you came out with the hard hitting of the straight, straight of the storage units. I was going to go a little bit on the other <laughs> side of it and uh, sitting, uh, you know, well, yes, there is a, there is a percentage of people that own quite a bit of stuff. There's also a more percentage of people that own hardly anything. Uh, as of 2015, there was, what was it, 45 million people uh, in the United States that live underneath the poverty line, barely staying above float with just the house or by Section 8, which they are given. You know, they do not own it. They just live there. Mm -hmm. um, as... Uh, we're still not quite at the level of house ownership. I, I lost most of my links when I uh, let my computer update today. Oh, no. But, uh, yeah. Well, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm not going to like hold you yeah. like he didn't present yeah. evidence. No, make uh, your arguments. That's all good. Um, as of 2000, you know, it's 2007 is when the house market crashed. Uh, more more uh, percentage of Americans are now renting the house instead of owning it. Now, while they do own the stuff inside the house, you know, that is still a commodity as of, uh, you know, a bed, a couch, clothing is still in there. While there is other subjects as, uh, you know, TVs, cell phones, laptops, uh, the United States does not rank first in any of these. Well, TVs, we did come back in 2015 to become number of TVs by household. I believe we own 2.59 TVs per household uh, in 20... We, were, we, we came down from 2016 because of the... Yeah. Um, Great Britain was right behind us at 2.59, I believe it was. Uh, Japan was up in there in the 2.3 range. Uh, and then uh, going back to cell phones, uh, I believe the United States and total consumerism cell phones were in fourth place behind, again, I believe it was Saudi Arabia, China, and uh, Japan. Might have been. I wish I had all That's my links because right. I had... I, I had everything uh, uh, clicked up on top here, but uh, so, you know, we don't, while we do have a lot of stuff, we don't rank the highest in things. So I think, you know, when you say own too much stuff, are you, are you basing it on, you know, what the average person contains in their lifestyle across the world, or are you owning it to everybody in the third world nations where, you know, it's just a, you own your house, you own some clothing, and you have your family. So that's that's where I pick off on that. Yeah, um, and you know, I think you're pretty good points, for sure. Oh, I'm sorry, did you have more? Oh, no, keep going, you go ahead. Okay, cool. Um, 
yeah, poverty is a good point. I mean, some people don't have enough stuff in that sense, some Americans. Um, you know, I'm kind of looking at an overall issue, and I suppose it's a little bit elitist to kind of say, well, you know, first world problems, uh, rich people have got too much stuff in their lives. Yes. Oh, boo-hoo for them, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, it is a bit insensitive in that regard. The four houses, um, the 12 cars. I, yeah. I have been poor. Yeah, I mean, I've been poor in America when I was uh, in college. You know, I was under the poverty line for... I don't know, most of my college years and a couple of years after that, as I kind of crawled my way out and I get to, to, to get a good look of uh, mostly what it's like to be poor in America. Now I wasn't a person without family, right? So my family didn't really give me money very often, but um, yeah, I could go to them. So I was never going to be destitute and homeless. I, I always had somewhere to go. Um, but you know, I had racked up a bunch of credit card debts and I paid for most of my own college and I paid for my room and board and I paid for just about everything that I could pay for during that time. And I was technically under the poverty level. Um, and, you know, slipping down and, and, uh, you know, you get a traffic ticket and I could like spiral into all these different charges and it was a nightmare. Right. So I got a good look at kind of what it's like to be poor. And I lived with other people in shared housing and some of them were on food stamps and, and, uh, you know, went to the homeless shelters to, to get their food and things. So, you know, I got a good firsthand experience with a, a lot of different people who are in a similar economic circumstance, but didn't have my ability to kind of fall back on, on others if I needed to. That gives you some confidence, I think, which is helpful. But anyway, I still had a lot of stuff. I, <laughs> I had yeah. a computer and, uh, you know, there, I could always get secondhand stuff at garage sales or from people. I get free things from people. So I know I didn't have a lot of money and they had stuff. Um, I had plenty of Dungeons and Dragons books and I had miniatures and I had robot toys and I had all kinds of things. What I didn't have was a big house because those are hella expensive. I didn't have a nice car because those are really expensive. Uh, I didn't have nice furniture. I slept on a dog bed with some, uh, you know, some, some blankets and stuff. So I think, you know, there's kind of a problem here in that. Uh, you know, property is incredibly expensive. Real estate, especially in cities, I lived in Seattle, is incredibly expensive. And people cannot afford that. But they actually, they can afford a lot of other little knickknacks and goo and and junk. And I used to pack it around from place to place. You know, these were kind of, when you're poor, that stuff is precious to you, right? You know, I mean, that's your only wealth, really, because uh, the bank account is like a negative number. Um, so, you know, it's kind of bad times. Work my way out of that. So, uh, you know, I don't blame people for liking the stuff that they can have at that stage, but it, it grows from there. And, you know, a lot of Americans who are in poverty, some stay there, but uh, some manage to rise out. And as they go, and I think that actually leads to the kind of hoarding behavior because, uh, you know, you remember the time when everything was precious and, and then you're like, oh, this roll of paper towels, boy, you know, back when I was poor, this would be a godsend. I better hold on to it, even though I've got 20 more from Costco in the, in the thing. So, um, you know, there's kind of a flip side to that. And I don't know what to say as far as like, for the resolution, people can decide for themselves. If there are poor people, do we not have too much stuff? If rich people are, have storage units all over the country? Um, I guess it depends. It is a good point on both sides. As far as like measuring any specific device, I think that's always hard because televisions come and go. You know, now people switch over to iPads and do they have more cell phones? Well, we still have a lot of landline infrastructure is where a lot of other countries just skip that start part of infrastructure and they're entirely cell phone based like in Africa and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it's hard to say it's just different cultural norms that people have. Um, I, one statistic I ran into while doing a little bit of research for this debate, just to come up with some of those numbers, was that the United States has 4% of the world's children and 40% buys 40% of the world's toys. Um, you know, and that's just kind of illustrative of a thing that's wonderful. We all like toys. I love toys as a kid. But do we need them? But I do look back and I go to like my, my sister is um, young enough to be my daughter. And when I went over to her place... I look at the number of toys that she had compared to the number of toys I had as a kid. I'm like, Oh my God, this is crazy. When I was a kid, all my toys fit into one big steamer trunk, right? If they didn't fit into the steamer trunk, I couldn't really have them. Everything had to fit in the steamer trunk Man, her room was just packed with stuff. Um, I mean, it was, it was crazy to me. Uh, so I don't know. <laughs> I had a lot of stuff too. Cause I was rich. At the time. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, I mean, that's why I came up with this topic. Just it's something yeah. I've observed. And I've, I have friends that still have lots of stuff and I and they their garages are full of stuff. They can't put their cars in the garage because the garage is full of stuff in boxes that they don't. It drives me crazy. No, I, I totally get you that there. You mean with the that, that's why I was, it was more of me trying to determine the line of what you're saying, which is hard to do because some people can say they have a lot of stuff. And some people are like, I hardly have anything. And you look at their their house and you're like, mm. No, you have lots of stuff, but uh, 
Yeah. Uh, and this is my next kind of like going into uh, rhetoric on this is it's it's kind of a play of words. Um, and it's it's just kind of a thing of like I'm my first debate is technically on Monday or tomorrow for the competition, mm -hmm. so I'm just using this as a kind of piece. But what do we technically own? You know, it's when it comes down to it, what what part of Americans own what? You can say we own our houses, but do we technically own our houses? You know, 80% of the population in the United States is in debt. 44% of those own a mortgage. So on those 44%, you know, you can technically say you own your house, but if you stop paying payments, bank goes, thanks for my house or our house back, you know, please move elsewhere. Uh, yeah, not so much. Uh, they can't do that anymore uh, with uh, foreclosures and... Oh, no, uh, no, no. I, I was saying, oh. yeah, you don't own it so much anymore, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was so, agreeing with you. Uh, you know, and with that, you know, with me, I have student debt. So because I'm still a student, you know, and it's it's racking up there, of course. But mm -hmm. uh, as credit card debt, you know, it keeps going up and up. And uh, as of last year, a study came out, 63% of Americans are dying with debt. I mean, still, you know, uh, it was $61,000 worth of debt still that uh, people were dying with as last year. So do you, you know, in that, in retrospect, like I said, it's a play on words. Do we technically own it, you know, or do we just consume it? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I mean, it kind of ties into my story. One of the things I did when I decided to do this traveling lifestyle thing and make a living as a writer, meaning I haven't made a living as a writer yet, but, um, but one of the things I did is I, you know, I sold everything I owned, I uh, bought this Airstream, I bought a trailer, but I bought everything cash, right? So I got yeah. rid of every last piece of debt I had. I had, you know, like most Americans, I had assets and I had debts, right? And they're all just kind of on the balance sheet. But I squared out the balance sheet and kind of cashed out my life. Um, was able to pay off all my debts, which is great. So I owe nobody anything. Nobody can take my home away from me. I can drive to anywhere I like with it. I have to pay rents and I have to pay insurance, food and things like that. Um, but it was kind of part of that break for me from all my stuff was a break from the debt that is part of kind of the American consumer lifestyle. And uh, I mean, I'll say I could only do it because I was kind of rich, right? I had a six figure salary and uh, I had an expensive house in Seattle that, you know, ended up being worth 30 to 40% more than I bought it for. So, you know, I got a lot of equity out of it. That's the only way I was able to do all that. But um, well, it sure is nice. <laughs> No. And I think that the consumer culture and people's love of stuff leads to uh, some of that debt, not all of it, but some of it. Um, the mortgage is, it's, you know, there's a limited amount of land and there's always more people. So that's what part of that is. But um, there's also just, you know, uh, a desire to buy things. Uh, you know, part of the debt I had from college was about a computer. Now, my whole life is about computers. So that maybe was actually a wise decision on my part. But um, you know, part of that debt was consumer debt. I, I probably could have bought a weaker computer. I probably could have done with a little bit less on some of the other things. But, um, you know, we all, I guess we all make our decisions, but it feeds into that. And I, I think it also leads to that, you know, if you look back in history, uh, the, the distribution of wealth between the, the, the minimal at the top and, and the majority at the bottom is almost always less differentiated when consumer debt is relatively low. When consumer debt spikes up, you get a transfer of wealth. And it makes sense because, uh, you know, poorer consumers are lending money to buy stuff. The rich people who make the stuff get the money, the profits from the stuff we buy, and then they also get the interest on the loans we took to buy the stuff. And so you end up with the middle and lower classes increasingly leveraged uh, into the people who own the capital, who own the debt. And you get a steady movement in that direction. Not the fault of people offering loans necessarily, um, unless the you know interest rates are exorbitant, like those Dollar Tree places and stuff, uh, or not Dollar Tree, but you know those le day lending places. I hate them. But you know regular <laughs> loans are not necessarily predatory. People take them for their own reasons. Um, but maybe we shouldn't take quite so many, and we should definitely not be taking out loans when we're paying for storage units to store the stuff we don't use. When you could instead sell that stuff to somebody else who might get some more use out of it and then pay off your debts, right? That would be a lot wiser. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's that, that's definitely a point. Um, and then when I was coming back to it, is you paid, off, if you, paid, you paid off your debt, but it took you selling all the stuff that you considerably own to make it down there, which now you're to your clothes, what you carry around, your vehicle that you tow it with, <laughs> and bit. your house. 
So I mean, and then there's obviously like your computer and you still have your cell phone and stuff. And that you, yeah, and you, I'm not, I'm not broke or poor. Yeah, right. No, you know, and I'm not saying that. But to get down to the point of where you could pay off everything, everything went good. Bye bye. <laughs> well, not everything, but yeah, a lot of know. stuff did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that was just kind of the the play on words I was using right there for the. Do we technically own the thing? Oh, I got you. Yeah, it makes some sense. Yeah. If we're looking at our balance sheets, are we in the red or are we in the black? And and so and are we just uh, living on borrowed stuff? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it was just kind of a, a little uh, play on words that I was like, yeah, I might use this later on and see how it works out. But no, with your with your debt stuff, and uh, I don't know, this is a little different uh, style than the competition. I was, I was thinking we were going to be doing one of the three to three minute back pieces. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For my... For the other debates, I like to do the open debate just to have a dialogue. Unless, like I said, it's either going to be really competitive or a grudge match. Uh, <laughs> in which case, uh, yeah, I want the three minutes so I, I don't like leap across the screen and like, no, you're wrong, wrong, so wrong. Uh, Talk for or, 41 minutes, they get four minutes of the whole thing, just kind of like, no, you get nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. I, I, I'll talk if you let me. So I have to watch myself on these, make sure I, oh. I don't monopolize. I mean, you, you. I mean, yeah. Like I've watched some of the other videos, and you pack a punch with just you know, even with the three minutes, and you know how to fill the time. Like I mean, you know how to use it, and me yeah. not so much yet. But well, look, you know, I I also don't usually consider these too much for the audience, so much as for the debaters, right? So yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple tips, a little off topic, but um. Uh, that I learned about the clock the first few times is one is uh, don't use all your time if you don't need your time. So I like to have my opening be about two minutes, like I time it. And then that way I can either rebut a little bit or I can just call it two minutes and hit the button. That saves me a minute for later, right? When I want to come back and I'm having a little more difficulty and it'll pad out on the end. So you always get your full 15 minutes, just a question of when you want to take it, but you can never take more than three. So if you're always shooting for a little under three, you never get cut off and uh, you have a little bit, you know, you can kind of pick that time up later. And if you're worried about like, you know, my sometimes your opponent will be like, he missed three points. He's letting them all go. You're like, yeah. You can just say, I'm going to come back to the rest of uh, my opponent's points in my next speech and then get back around to him. So it's a good, good use of the time. Uh, some of the other debaters will do that too. Also, if people ask you questions, um, usually it's it's very honest thing. They just want an answer, but it's quite possible to waste other people's times with questions. So uh, if you're going to answer questions, you get a choice, really. You can either just very quickly try to answer the question, get it back to them so you don't need much of your time, or you can use your answer time to extend on something and make it all the harder for them to uh, uh, to squeeze in their three minutes to get to get back on that. So it's kind of a choice, I guess. But that comes up a little bit with the clock. Um, okay. Those are my moon clock tips. Okay, cool. All right. I, uh, yeah, if we can go back. All right, if we can go back. I, if you have more stuff to say, I'm, like I said, I was had a lot more stuff to say, and I don't quite remember all the statistics I had from numbers, and it's kind of hard to start talking on something and then not put out any statistics and be like, I think 71% and it was really like 45. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the other time. You you can eat up a lot of time trying to read quotations. Um, What I've taken to doing lately, I mean, I'm still experimenting on here. I think I've done about 14 debates or so now. Um, One of the things I will do is um, I'll put all my citations kind of at the bottom of my notes. I'll label them like what they're for. And then in my you know, my opening is almost always canned to some degree. I will reference the content of those quotes without actually doing the quotes. Like in this, I'll say, you know, studies show that da, 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 da. And then if somebody's like, well, what studies? And I'll scroll down. Well, from New York Times, you know, 2017, study from Rasmussen, right? That's, that's okay. what that's from. Because <clears throat> sometimes it's going to be relevant. Sometimes you get challenged on it and sometimes you won't. I mean, so long as you're being honest, it, it doesn't matter. And then for the competition ones, I'll post my quotes in the bottom just so that if anyone wants to follow up on them, they can. But uh, I, you know, everybody here I've met is honest. I don't see anybody fabricating evidence or doing anything like that. So, eh, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, I suppose it's possible. 
So I've been experimenting with citations because in a couple of my early debates, I just felt like I was eating up tons of time saying from the New York Times in 2017 in an article titled blah, 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 blah. Somebody said this giant paragraph of stuff. And really the only thing I care about is it said somewhere in there 6% of whatever's did whatever. Um, and, yeah. you know, it just seemed like a big waste of time um, to get that little nugget of information. And so um, I know I've been working on trying to figure out how, to, how you condense that down so that if you do it too fast, of course, people don't hear it. I did another case where I'd like, you know, 17 points and half of them people just didn't hear because it was my point was one sentence long, right? Nobody cares. So I learned you, you can't do that either. You've got to have a little weight on every point that you're going to give or it just slides yeah. on by. I think that's kind of what I, you know, a couple of things I did in here. I, I was just, I'm a fast talker. I like to talk with people, especially at the bar when I'm there and it just flow, 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 flow. So, but uh, yeah, I mean, I would like to talk, you know, I, I'm trying to find some of my other stuff if I can find it in my history. I hate when computers do things they're not supposed to do. Yeah, that's no good. Yeah, certainly for the day, I copy all my stuff out into a little note file. And uh, I use it there. I have seen people look up things during debates. You know, it's perfectly legit, of course, in, in this format. So, uh, um, yep. and that can work out, but they always sound a little disorganized doing it, right? They're like, oh, hold on a second. It's loading uh, from, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> from that Google. ends up, yeah, that ends up chewing up time like crazy, right? Which is, is kind of brutal. The whole efficiency thing I learned in my first like five debates is pretty critical. Yeah. Uh, and then do you know what the, for uh, responding to like, I know they say like you have to respond to your uh, debate to be able to consider to be able to debate it. When are they supposed to do that by? Cause I, my opponent for tomorrow at 9 PM still hasn't done that. And I got my message on Wednesday. I'm not sure. Um, you know, I always just try to get on it right away and say, yep, sounds good to Same. me. Um, and then, and yeah, I don't, you know, so long as they show up, I haven't had anybody not show up yet, but I've seen as I watched the brackets in the last tournament, trying to see who my opponents would be, um, that, I'll, you know, there were a fair number of no-shows in the early round. People just wouldn't show up or they couldn't agree on a time or some weird stuff, which is too bad because, you know. There's brackets on there that you can look at? Uh, yeah, so for the last tournament, they had one. They didn't have it in the first round, but uh, in later rounds... Okay. They had a little visual bracket and you could see, I think there were just too many people to show it on the screen uh, or that, you know, or their machine only goes up to 32 participants or something like that. I think they had 64 rounds of the first, uh, the first round last time. And, uh, and they didn't show the bracket until the second round. Okay. Yeah. And it was, I guess new, I it was just the first time to... they'd done it. I, I, like, I didn't know this was the 45 seconds. So I was going to try and test out like, how everything worked on it with just going with this one because I felt it was better to jump in trying uh, something than do nothing and then figure it out. So sorry about that. Yeah, that's a good idea, by the way. I mean, I think that's a great idea. And I did the same. You know, I did a casual debate before I did a um, a, uh, a tournament one, but I had the same thing. I got one of these forty five minutes, so I didn't really get to to do the thing with the timer. The the timer they'll um, just so you know uh, the times will be listed below your portrait instead of above like it is here. And so down below you will be a button that says pass the mic so that the uh, pro starts being able to speak by default. Uh, then, uh, you know, when you're done, you click the mic. If your time, if your three minutes runs out, it automatically mic passes and just cuts you off. And, um, you know, which isn't a big deal, but you're like, oh, I had some more to say. Uh, and like I said, if you pass early, it'll also show you kind of your total pool remaining. Um, what I've taken to doing is I have my screen kind of split. So like over here on my screen are my notes. And then over here is the, the call out visual. And I like to move my notes to whichever side my position is so that I can be looking at my notes, but also out of the corner of my eye, peripheral vision, see my timer. Uh, and I kind of keep an eye on it. And then I know if I'm getting down to 30 seconds, I need to wrap up whatever it is I'm doing. Um, and and kind of get that done, um, and uh, gotten a little better better about dodging the clock that way because it's I can see it all the time while I'm looking at my notes. As where other times I get too distracted on on something else, I look back and I'm like, ah, I got no time. Yeah. All righty. Thank you very much. Little things. Yeah. Hey, small things go a long way in a lot of things. Yeah, when you have three minutes, everything <laughs> counts, right? That's that's what I learned. 
All righty. Well, uh, I have nothing else to say, unfortunately. And Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Still, I enjoyed uh, discussing the topic with you. Um, uh-huh. So here's here's my last tip. Uh, if you're in a debate, which, which sometimes happens even in the tournament, and there's, there's nothing more to do, there's a, a button up there that says end debate, and then you can kind of wrap it up. So uh, I look forward to seeing your tournament round. I'll, I'll definitely watch it, and uh, uh, maybe we'll do another topic sometime. I'm going to say I look forward to not facing you in the next tournament round, but uh, if it so happens, good luck to the best of you. Yep, thanks. Bye-bye.